Well, good morning, folks. It's great to see you this morning. It's good uh, to be gathered in on this lovely Sunday morning to come and worship the Lord. If you don't know who I am, my name is Trevor, and I'm the minister here in uh, Glenwary. As you come in, you should have got a little notice sheet that highlights most of the things that are happening over the course of the incoming week, but please allow me just to highlight a few things. Just a reminder that we meet for worship this evening at 7 p.m., continuing our studies in the Book of Acts. If you're pr free, please plan to come along uh, this evening at 7 p.m. Wednesday evening, we'll have our prayer meeting, which will be at the new time of half past eight, half past eight, and the uh, idea on Wednesday evening is that we'll come together just for half an hour. We're going to pray for the mission that's coming up in September. So if you're free on Wednesday evening, half past eight, please come along to pray for the mission. Remember, the Friday Friendship Club is on this Friday at two to four. And then just to highlight a few other things, next Sunday at 12, we're looking forward to having the Reverend James Hindman with us, and that will also be our Children's Day. So again, if you're free, uh, please come along and support the children in Children's Day. It's next Sunday at 12, and then next Sunday at 7, we continue in with our evening worship. And then just to highlight a few things that uh, maybe aren't on uh, the notice sheet, just a reminder about the soup and pudding lunch. That will be the last Sunday in June. That's going to be our big marking, I suppose, if you like, of our 200th anniversary. So if you're planning on staying, please sign up on the sheet. Uh, again, you're not committing yourself to it. It's just to give us a rough idea of how many that we need to cater for on that Sunday. If you were here last Sunday evening, you heard a, a great word about the work that Tobias is doing in uh, Denmark. As a church, as a congregational committee, we have decided to support Tobias with up to a thousand pounds a year, uh, and that's going to be contributed via your church envelopes. Now, that works out at about uh, roughly 80 pounds a month, 84, 85 pounds a month, something like that, uh, which will be collected via the, the missionary envelopes in your church envelopes. We're not really asking you to do anything about that, uh, just to note it, uh, and, and if you're in a position to do so, uh, and you feel led to do so, to just note that it will be about 83, 84 pounds a month extra that we need to find. Tickets for the Irish Women's Convention go on sale next uh, Saturday. Suzanne is hoping to take a group from the church up to assembly buildings to uh, the Irish Women's Convention. Tickets are priced at £18. It will be on Saturday, October the 14th. And if you want any more details, uh, you can uh, speak to Suzanne about it. Is that okay? Yeah, we're all right. And then finally, uh, this morning, it's my great delight on your behalf to be able to welcome uh, James and Angela Gordon. James was minister here for many, many years, uh, and as part of our 200th anniversary celebrations, we're delighted uh, that James has returned and will take the service this morning. And so I'll hand over to you now, James. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Trevor, for those very warm words of welcome. It's really good to be here again this morning uh, in Glen Whirley. And a couple of reasons come to my mind. First of all, just because it's good to be here and everything's looking so well. And secondly, every Sunday uh, when I was preaching regularly, I always got a Sunday morning Ulster Fry. Uh, and after I retired, she gave me a boiled egg on a Sunday morning. This morning I got the Ulster Fry. So a double, a double reason for being glad to be here. Now Angela's with me. She's way down the back there. If I change the glasses, actually, it's come to that stage. I can see her. Uh, she is this morning the international woman of mystery. She's wearing dark sunglasses, and that's because she had cataract surgery last Tuesday, uh, and so has to wear these glasses. Everything's very, very bright. So if you wonder why she's wearing sunglasses in the church, that's the reason for it. Uh, but she was so keen to, to be here uh, this morning uh, sharing worship with us. So it's really good to be here, and uh, we look forward to praising God and worshiping God together. And it's a very important occasion, important month, the 200th anniversary of uh, Glenwary Congregation. Therefore, we must pay closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Our Father God, we give you thanks that we are able to gather here in your presence. We give you thanks for your touch, the touch of your Holy Spirit. We give you thanks that we are able to gather here in freedom of worship and glorify your name. And we ask you to take from our hearts and minds all that might distract us, that we will give glory and honor to your name, to Father and Son and Holy Spirit, through Christ our Lord. Amen. 
find the words of our opening praise on the screen. Praise my soul, the King of heaven, to his feet thy tribute bring. Now that is a hymn that my wife and I got married to. That was played as we walked up the aisle, so that will, that will please her immensely to see that hymn on this morning, and it would please me. Praise my soul, the King of heaven. <coughs> Humble our hearts as we draw near to God's throne in prayer. Let us pray. <clears throat> our Father God, in the quietness, in the stillness, we come before you now. We give you thanks that we can gather once again in fellowship together. Into the peace of your presence we bring our restless lives in a world that so often rejects you. And we thank you today for the faithfulness and the vision of those who have gone before us, especially as we reflect on the 200 years since the foundation of this congregation. We are aware that we stand on the shoulders of those who have gone before us and cannot truly imagine what life was like in this community so many years ago. Yet, in a constantly changing and challenging world, we are assured from your word that you do not change. We ever look to Jesus, the author 
and the finisher of our faith. The same yesterday and today and forever. Your Hebrew people of old journeyed by your guidance, a pillar of cloud by day and fire by night, and they rested on your lap. When they failed you and went their own way, in fullness of time you restored them and brought them back to yourself. As we come humbly before you this morning, stimulate, we pray, our own minds and spirits that we too will be conscious of your guiding and leading in our own lives, our minds fired by the unchanging truth that you have revealed to us in your word. We come this morning with hearts filled with adoration and with praise. We rejoice in your gifts of authentic fellowship and meaningful worship. Fill our hearts, we pray, to overflowing with your love and enable us to build our lives on what you've revealed to us. For without you, life has no source or purpose or destiny. Inspire us by your Holy Spirit. Forgive us when we grieve him. Refresh our faith as flowers after rain. Restore our confidence and lay your guiding hand on each of our lives. Our Father God, we come to you today with praise and thanksgiving and commit our lives once more into your keeping. We give you thanks for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, that most precious of gifts. We rejoice that you have raised us from our sin to a new quality of life and living. We thank you for our friends who love us, our fellow believers with whom we have learned so much in the passing years, for the height and depth of our human experience. And we rejoice in your creation, the wonder of the universe, the beauty of nature in this most be lovely of days, and especially the words that you have revealed to us in the scriptures. But above all, we do thank you for Jesus, for his birth and ministry, his death and resurrection, his exaltation to glory, and for the outpouring of his Holy Spirit. For those special moments of revelation deep within our own souls, when we have felt our hearts moved and our spirits lifted, our confidence restored, the assurance of our sins forgiven. And so as we step into the future, make us, we pray, brave and courageous in our witness, remembering those who have gone before us. Give us, we pray, a sense of fellowship with those whom your word calls the saints, the believers of every age, that we may be forever encouraged on our spiritual journey. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You'll find our reading this morning in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 1, and we read from verse 1 to verse 9. Let us hear God's word. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, when he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, 
Are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. Amen. May God bless to us this reading from his word. To his name be glory and praise forever. Amen. Now, boys and girls, please join me up at the front for a moment. Some of you can go into the pew behind, you know, you don't all have to be in the front pew. Now, here's a wee question for you. Do it again, change your glasses again, isn't it desperate, eh? Two pair here. There's something that we all have. We all have this. Now, do you know what it would be? That's, that's too, oh, if you answer this, the, the whole service is going to be shortened by half an hour, yeah? School. School. Mm. Not school, did you say? Sin. Sin. Oh, well, okay, sin. I'm going deaf as well as I can't see. <laughs> uh, uh, sin, you're right. Well, that's right. Well, I wasn't thinking of that just at this point, but you're quite right, absolutely right, yes? A house? Yeah, well, many of us have a house. I'm thinking of something that every one of you will have. I'll give you another clue. Um, Martin had one. <laughs> he made him jump in his seat there, didn't it? He had one uh, last month. Was that the big one, Martin? Yeah. No. And uh, Trevor had one quite recently. Yeah, he had one. And, uh, well, I had one uh, quite a long while ago now. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've forgotten. I've forgotten movie tool. Hold on. Stay, just talk among yourselves while I pick up this, this wee machine. Uh, you'll probably have got the answer now, I would think. I'm not used to using one of these now, you see, but what, what do we all have then? I've given you a really good clue there. Yes. Yeah, they couldn't hear you at the back. You're right. Uh-huh. There we are. Now, what am I seeing here? There you go. Happy birthday. We all have birthdays. And we all, well, what do we get on birthdays? Yeah. We get presents, yes. We get lovely things. Uh, and we get cards. And we get one of these. We get a cake. And you can see it behind me there. Happy birthday on it. And it's tremendous. It's great. And we all look forward to our birthdays. Now, this month is special. Because you know what has a birthday this month? Yeah. The church is exactly right. The church's birthday, and the church is how many years old here? Yes? In one sense, you're absolutely right, yeah. Uh-huh. And this, this one here, 200, 2,000, is not far off the mark indeed, yeah. In fact, we could go back to Abraham if we're really going to be good Presbyterians, yes? 200, 200, 200 this month. And we'll be talking a wee bit, you'll be out maybe, but we'll be talking a wee bit this just in passing later on. Uh, today. So there's the birthday and there's the church. Well, we also know that and a nice sign in the side of it now. That was never there in times past when I was here. Lovely sign on on, on the side of it saying what it is and what you're doing, making disciples. Tremendous. Now, 200 years is a very long time. And let's think about this for a moment. I don't have a photograph of the church 200 years ago in 1823. That's when the church began, 1823. Why do you think I wouldn't have a photograph of it? Yes? I really am going deaf, you know. You're very, very close, yes. You might just about have had a type of a camera, but it would have been as big as this table, and folk didn't have access to it. Ordinary folk wouldn't have had access to the camera. So there might just have been... 
uh, a camera round about a wee bit slightly before that, but nobody would have a photograph taken of the church. There's one in the minister's room, which is quite a long time ago, but not as long ago, of course, as that. So can you imagine that? There were no cameras then, and there were no mobile phones that you could have taken out of your pocket and taken out. Can you imagine a world without mobile phones? Can you? Yeah? Say that again to me. The photos are on the wall. Yes, photos are on the wall. There's, 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 uh, there's a whole lot of photos on the wall. In fact, there's 11 photos on the wall if you were to go in there, as well as the one of the church. And uh, uh, about four back, there's a very good looking fellow on there. I forget his name now. <laughs> and the other three after that aren't so good. And the, the next good looking one will be over here, somewhere be there, down there. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah. So anyway, there you are. And yes, now, I can only tell you something about the church in times past. I wrote this down because I wouldn't have remembered it otherwise. And this is what we heard. Now, the place where your minister now stands is up here. And we know that's called the pulpit. All right, I want to ask you a silly question. You know that's called the pulpit. But way back then, do you know where the pulpit was? You don't? It was there. That's what we had been told. It was in the middle of that wall, with its back to what is now the hall. And the door of the church, there was no vestibule, no wee place down there. The door of the church, we're told, was on this side, uh, with its back to the road. And the congregation had all been facing this way way back then, way back then, and that was, well, 200 years ago. The people all sat facing the pulpit, and they were facing a different direction, and we heard this ourselves from a very old lady, very old lady, and when we came here, it was in 1976, and she was obviously still living, but she'd been born in the 1800s, so she was very old. How did people get to church then? Quickly, tell me, yes? They had to walk, for there were no cars, no cars, even when she was coming to the church. She couldn't come by car. She was born in the 1800s, long, long time ago, and she and her sisters, she told us, had shoes. Well, of course they had shoes. But when they were coming to church, they walked, and they weren't allowed to wear their shoes until they got to the church. They had to walk across the fields and to cross a burn, a river, and when they reached the door of the church, they were allowed to put their shoes on. Can you imagine what your feet would be like, all squelchy and muddy, if you had to walk through the fields and cross a wee river to get to church this morning? Eh? Aren't we lucky we're not like that now, really? But that's true. And she was, she, she was able to tell us that herself, that in the very early days, when she was a wee girl, that's what they had to do. Now, let's see what else we've got here. Any of you go to Moorfields Primary School? Okay. Anybody not go to Moorfields Primary School? Okay. All right. Well, Moorfields, my, my, my children, when they were children, they're all grown up now, they went to Moorfields, and we called it the Moorfields Academy Seat of Great Learning. You know, that was the name we gave to it way back then. Now, I want you to close your eyes for a second, and in your own minds, picture what you've got in the classroom today. All right? It's an interactive whiteboard, and you may have a big, big touch screen. Some schools have those now as well. There'll be iPads. There'll be Lego for P1, P2. There'll be toys. There'll be wall displays of all your work, and there'll be lots and lots of books. Great. Now, open your eyes again. This is what the school looked like in 1823. It hasn't come up on my screen. Is it up on your screen? No. You see, there were no schools back then in 1823. No schools at all. Imagine not having to go to school. You wouldn't want that. Sure you wouldn't. <laughs> well, an honest man. There you are. An honest man. All right. Well, then after that, now this just has not going back as far as that, a wee bit later, but that was called a hedge school. It was, you can see why it was called a hedge school. It was in the hedge that had no building, no roof, called a hedge school, and teachers would go around the countryside teaching little groups of boys and girls like that there. And there's other ones like that. There's a hedge school again. There's another one. 
just sitting on the dike there. Look. And there was another one. That's a wee bit later. Schools really started to come in about 1892, much later. But then that was the way they were then. And then this is one. Look at that boy. Holding a cane. Hey, hey. So there's no canes today, but holding a cane. And if anybody was disobedient, then the cane would come down. Aren't you lucky that there are no canes in schools today? I can remember when there were canes in schools. Uh, but no, no, uh, no canes today, and you're very lucky. But that was what school would have been like way back then. And there's the church again, as it is today. Now, think of 200 years and all the differences that you can see there, all those things that have changed, so many changes in 200 years, even the last 50 years. And your mummies and daddies or grannies or granddads could remember. But one thing hasn't changed. God hasn't changed, not in the slightest way at all. God is the same yesterday and today and always. Very important that we remember that. And it's God who puts the seed in our hearts and in our minds of men and women, boys and girls, young folk, to build a church in Glenwherry. Way back then, the same God who puts the seed in our own hearts, reminding us of how much we need him, how much we need Jesus. That we are able to come together in family worship because of what all those folk did years and years and years and years ago. And we have got a place we can come in the church here and in the hall and we can learn about Jesus through Sunday, every Sunday, Wilfred, and in Sunday school, and in boys' brigade, and in girls' brigade. And we learn all about Jesus and all the organizations that we have here. And we know how Jesus gave his life on the cross for us. Now, he gave everything for us on that cross. Nothing held back. We know that. And you'll know this from your Sunday school. And we were reminded at the very start, the thing we all have in common was sin. And you're dead right. And we all have to be forgiven. And we can only be forgiven when we love Jesus. And all he asks of us when he gave everything for us is that we come to him, we ask him into our hearts and in our lives, and we trust him as our saviour and our friend. And that's something that all of us, all of us here, everybody here, that's something we all have to think about very seriously, isn't it? It is. Now tell me this, are you good singers? Who's a good singer? Okay, a couple. Who's not a good singer? Like this here, the hands are going like this. Well, in another couple of minutes, you're all going to be brilliant singers because you're all going to sing out as loud as you can, all right? And if anybody's walking up the road outside there, I want them to be jumping because all this noise is coming out of here. The congregation will help us, all right? But we're going to do most of it. Do you know the, wor- do you know the, the actions of this here, my God is so big? Who knows the actions for that? One, just yourself. Two, three. Who doesn't know the actions for this? Well, again, you're going to learn them very quickly. Uh, Okay, now, I'll put that down. Martin has given me instructions not to push that button, except for the children's talk. There it is sitting there. (laughs) Won't touch it. Uh, My God is so big, so strong as almighty. Um, I won't ask one or two just to come up and do the actions. Uh, stand up, just here, and you too, and then we'll ask them all to stand up as well, and we're going to try and do the action, and the first time we'll sing it, very simple, we're just going to take the one verse, we'll do that, and, and then we'll sing it again, and we'll sing it louder, and by then you'll all know the actions, all right? You'll be glad to see the back of me, you'll think your minister's really very kind to you, no doubt, compared to what I'm doing to you, but there you are. My God is so big, so strong and mighty. we stand to praise God. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing
anyway, who wasn't singing out as loud as they could? <coughs> this time you're going to sing out as loud as you can, all right? They'll still help us, but you're going to really sing out loud. I'm going to be hoarse by the end of this, all right? <coughs> now, here we go again. So strong and so mighty, there's nothing that we cannot do. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing that we cannot do. The rivers are His, the mountains are His, the stars are His. Sunday school, is that right? You all going? Do you go back down to the pure straight out? Do whatever, do whatever you normally do. We worship God with our offering. our heads in prayer. All that we have, our Father God, belongs to you. Nothing can we truly call our own. Except these are gifts, we pray, bless them and use them for the work of your church, for the extension of Christ's kingdom. Take to our lives as we offer them in service before you. Shape us and mold us according to your heart's desire, that we would be what you would have us be, to the glory and the praise of your name. Our Father, we have come before you this morning with our prayers of praise and of thanksgiving. And we recognize also our privilege to come in confession and intercession before you. You know our hearts. You know us when we lie down and when we rise up. You know us in our strengths and in our weaknesses. You know us as we are. 
And so we acknowledge that we must ever come in confession before you, for nothing is hidden from you. And we so often fail you. We are self-centered in our sinfulness, trying to tell you how we think things should be done and often in our own minds, endeavoring to justify the unjustifiable. Rather, let us acknowledge our sin against you in denying the truths of your word by our words and actions, in our fearfulness to be totally faithful to your revealed truth, and often in the coolness of our relationship with you and with each other. Remind us that... Once we have committed our lives to you, we are called to be a new creation. And this must be evident in our own lives and in our fellowship. We acknowledge Christ alone as our mediator, our great high priest, tempted even as we are yet alone without sin, willing and able to forgive us our sins as we come in humble repentance before him. Coming in the silence of reflection, hear us, we pray, as we confess our sins of thought, of word, and of action, and ask forgiveness in Jesus' precious name. Lord, in the silence, hear our prayer. <clears throat> Grant to us, we pray, the assurance of sin forgiven, and that we may serve you truly in the newness of life, to the glory of your name. Ours is the privilege also to come before you in intercession, to bring our joys and our sorrows, our hopes and our fears. We live in an increasingly dangerous world, and we continue to remember those areas of conflict where there are continuing tensions, and many are fearful for their loved ones. We remember especially those who are in the persecuted church, our brothers and sisters in the Lord, who do not know the safety to worship that we can still take for granted in our own land. We thank you for all those who have responded to your call to serve in foreign fields of mission, through our own church and through other mission agencies, so often far from friends and loved ones and for our missionaries, especially in South America, in Africa, and on the continent of Europe. We remember those who are in need today, especially we remember in India, those who have lost loved ones through the tragedy of that real crash. And we remember all those who are in need in whatever part of our world. We remember those who are endeavoring to alleviate their pain and their suffering, and we pray for them. In particular, we pray for the church here on our own island, in this place wherein your sovereignty you have set us. We pray for our many congregations, north and south, in situations where numbers are small, and in those places, especially in the Republic, where congregations, once seemingly on the point of closure, can now in changed circumstances be comprised of many, from a myriad of backgrounds and nationalities, of cultures, and of languages, yet all one in Christ Jesus. We pray for the preparations being made for our General Assembly meeting later this month, and for our moderator, John Kirkpatrick, as he comes to the end of his year of office, for our incoming moderator, Sam McGuinney, as he prepares to take up that role for the next church year, along with all those who will be appointed to positions of responsibility. We pray too for the members of Kirk Session here in Glenwary in their spiritual oversight of the congregation under the guidance of your minister Trevor. Bless him and Suzanne and their family in these days. We remember the members of church committee and all who serve in whatever capacity in terms of leadership. We ask that all will be done to the glory of your name. And we remember all those who are ill at this time members of the congregation at home or in hospital, those in nursing homes and those who have known the trauma of bereavement in recent times. We bring them before your throne of grace. We ask that they will know your touch, the embrace of your loving arms. 
And we ask for that touch of healing, that they may have the assurance that they are in our thoughts and in our prayers. And all this we ask through Jesus' precious name. Amen. Again, stand to praise God as we sing the hymn, Standing on the Promises of Christ our King. And I again say, how nice it is to be with you this morning. I have really encountered many, dare I say, old faces. Uh, I was saying to someone before the service, somehow or other, I still see people as they were 30 or 40 years ago. Uh, and if you're in that category, be assured you haven't changed one bit. <laughs> Neither have I. That's wishful thinking, isn't it? But it's good to be here and good to gather in the presence of God. I was installed here, along with Angela, on the 26th of May in 1976, just over 47 years ago, uh, last week there. And it's hard to credit, but there it is. And this is a special occasion for you, 200th anniversary this month. And I want for a moment to, to look at that and to think about that under three headings. The first of them, a new beginning a glance at the pattern of the past. It really just will be a glance. I mean, it's not a history lecture, but in the context of the service, we want to think about that for a moment. And then uh, a pause in the present and a focus on the future. 
those three hands. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> I'm told by Martin that I can use this little machine again at the appropriate point. Uh, and I hope we get it right. If I get it wrong, you keep me right, Martin. It's a far cry from a blackboard in that corner with chalk on it, and then an overhead projector, so things have obviously moved on greatly. A new beginning. A glance at the pattern of the past. Now, it may seem strange to take a new beginning as the title for something that was starting 200 years ago. But someone has remarked that unless we know where we've come from, we can never be sure of where we're going. In the history of congregations, and I looked this up, the, the, the history reads like this. The minutes of a meeting of the Antrim Presbytery held in Ballyclare on the 13th of August, 1672, refer to a request of a Francis Graham of Glenhwyrie to have his child baptised. William Shaw was appointed to go to Glenhwyrie, baptise the child, and encourage the Presbyterians in the area to join some congregation. They agreed to link themselves to the parish of Ballyclare. 1672. But it didn't stop there, obviously. We read in Proverbs 29 and verse 18 that where there is no vision, the people perish. Some 200 years ago, men and women in this area had a vision, an important vision. And on the 27th of June in 1823, the Presbyterians we read in the Glenwherry district applied to the General Synod, what we would now call the General Assembly, for permission to erect a congregation and call a minister, and they promised a stipend of 50 pounds per annum. Permission was granted, and in June 1825, it was further reported that a meeting house had been built and the congregation was increasing in numbers. The first minister was ordained on the 6th of September, 1825. As I mentioned to the children, there have been 11 ministers since, including that one. Now that's just a wee bit of history. It's important given the context of the service this morning and of the services that you'll be having, God willing, in the coming weeks. Because that's what it's all about. You're celebrating 200 years in the life of Glenwary Congregation. And those who are older will have seen many changes even in their own lifetime. And we have thought with the children of the changes that have been seen over that 200 year period. But what's really important is the God given vision of the people back then, 200 years ago, and even prior to that, as we have, we have read there. And names that probably would be familiar even in the community today. And the vision was there, which was going to be costly, not only in physical terms, 50 pounds was quite a sum in those days for a relatively small community, but also in terms of spiritual commitment. And yet they went ahead. They wanted a living spiritual fellowship. And they were prepared to make significant sacrifices to see their vision brought to fruition. Just a glance at the past, really. But an important glance, because without knowing what has gone before, then we're in a bit of a vacuum. We have to know the past in order to see where we are now and to have our vision renewed for the future. Without that vision, as we read, the people perish. But just a glance. It's not a history lecture. And so much for the past, therefore. Just to put it in context. In 2023, our main concern is to pause in the present and then focus on the future. Pausing in the present. Use your imagination for a moment. Put yourself back 200 years. I wonder if you honestly feel that you would have had the foresight to have been with those who were standing in the forefront of the endeavors to get a congregation built here. Would you have had the vision back then, do you think, with that total commitment that it involved? To put it right into the present, 
right up to date. How did you feel as you came out to church this morning? Was there a sense of anticipation? Was there a sense in which you were going to meet together with God's people to truly come and worship before him? How did you feel? Was there an enthusiasm to meet with others around God's word, to join together in prayer, to greet one another in Christian fellowship? Now, you may answer that question to me, yes, absolutely, in which case, praise God. But you may have to answer in a very busy and challenging world, you know, distraction can happen easily. And really, there were other things in my mind when I was coming out. I sort of rushed at the last moment. I wasn't thinking ahead. I wasn't planning ahead. It can happen. And yet, we know, as Saul found on the Damascus Road, that once we have truly met with the risen Lord, nothing can ever be truly the same again. And so we would come, surely, in a sense of, well, I don't want to say passion, passionate about this, because it's an overworked word that I often feel. Everybody has to be passionate about everything, but certainly with anticipation, certainly with a sense that we are coming together to meet together, not just out of habit, but truly to experience the touch of the living God. Maybe that's what was in your head. Or maybe, you see, as I say, it's a, a challenging world we're living in. Maybe, in all honesty, we have to say to ourselves, look, I maybe should have had more of a thought in my mind for the things of God as I came out. Or maybe not. But that's why we started our service with that verse from Hebrews, the, the verse that we took earlier. Let us pay the more careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. For how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? You know that verse, Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 1. You've probably heard sermons on that verse. And the thinking of the author of Hebrews there was almost uh, descriptive of a little boat drifting from its moorings. And you almost don't notice it until it's too late. Or like a ring slipping from the finger. This one on me is, is pretty tight fit. Used to have another ring at a war in this finger here. And on two occasions, I nearly lost it. One, we were on holiday, we were in France. And I was doing the washing up, the clothes. I was wringing them out, you know, the way men you, you do when you're on holiday with the wives and they give you this to do in England. It's really right. the, the ring wasn't there because the soapy water loosened things. And I wasn't aware of it at all. I got it back. And back to the front of the tent where we were staying and it was there on the ground. I was fortunate. And it happened again. It happened again, well, when we were down in Katy, actually. And I was watching folk playing bowls, and I heard this tinkle on the ground in, in, in the hall. There it was in the ground. I don't wear it anymore. Uh, it, it's, in, it's in a box now, you know, because I lost it nearly twice, almost imperceptibly. And that can happen to us. It can happen to any one of us because we live in a very challenging world, a world very different from 200 years ago, a world very different, many of us will remember, from even 50 years ago. No home computers then, no mobile phones. One of our problems today is that we, we find ourselves living in a, a world of the instant. Everything should be instant. And our church, if you read the reports, you won't have seen them, but when they come online eventually to the General Assembly, we'll touch on this, finding ways to speak to that younger generation, especially who live in the world of the instant. We, we go to... Starbucks for an instant coffee. We go to McDonald's for an instant burger. We go to Timothy Horton's for an instant breakfast. And we have instant communications. We can communicate to the other side of the world. Totally inconceivable half a century ago, never mind 200 years. And we can speak to someone in America, in Australia, wherever. And we have our mobile phones. And we're expected to be in contact whether we're sitting on a beach in the Bahamas or whether we're on the East Strand in Port Rush. Sunday School Excursion will remember that. And we're expected to respond instantly to someone contacting us. Now, we know we live in that type of world. 
But the reality of Scripture is that God doesn't think in those terms of instance like that. We are told time and time again that we must be patient and wait on the Lord. So if we are pausing at this point in 2023, how much time do we spend actually waiting on the Lord? Because we don't sometimes, oh, we have instant salvation. I know that justification at a point in time. That's not what we're talking about here. It's growing in that relationship. It's knowing that fellowship with God as we grow in fellowship with each other. Think of the number of references. I didn't write them all up on the screen, but the biblical references are there. You can take a note of them. Psalm 40 and verse 1. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. Isaiah 30, 18. Yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you. Therefore, he will rise up to show you compassion. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all who wait for him. Lamentations 3 and 24 to 26. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those who hope in him. To the one who seeks him, it is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Isaiah 64 verse 4. God acts for those who wait for him. Psalm 46 and verse 10. The overall context. Be still and know that I am God. Psalm 27 verse 14. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart. And wait for the Lord. Isaiah 40, 31. Very well known verse. Those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. And finally, Acts 1 and verse 4. As we read earlier. Wait for the gift that the Father has promised. We live in a fast moving world. But we need to reflect on waiting on the Lord. This is important because perhaps some of the shallowness that we can sometimes find, sometimes even in, in the churches, is because we are not prepared to wait on the Lord in the way that Scripture describes. That whether it's our congregations or our Presbyterian church in Ireland, as I've said, it comes up in the annual reports this year, whether it's in the wider church, worldwide, or whether it's in our own lives as individuals, we need to wait on the Lord. For it's then that we are built up in our strength. It's then we are built up under God to be witnesses for him. And after all, that is our high calling, to witness for the Savior. And in so doing, waiting on the Lord in order that we are equipped for lives of committed Christian service, then we are focused on the future. We reflect on 200 years of history. That's part of your celebrations, commemorations at this time. That's why we're doing it this way. But primarily we are reflecting on where we are now also, pausing in the present, in order to focus on the future. And that's for congregations and for our denomination as it happens. There are some very radical things being talked about uh, over the next two general assemblies, according to what we've been reading in, in the Blue Book. Focusing on the future. Discerning the mind of God for ourselves, for our generation, for our gospel outreach. Fitting ourselves into God's plan and purpose. Not actually doing what sometimes we maybe are inclined to do, trying to fit God into our plan and purpose, if we're honest. If we do that, then we fall into the trap of 2 Timothy 3 and verse 5. We have the form of religion, but we deny the power of it. But the power is ours, isn't it? In Christ. How do we know that? God's word tells us. The power is ours. Yours and mine when we trust in the Savior. We are not called to go out fearful. Rather, we are called to go out without fear. Because God is with us. Now, we do live in very challenging times. Let me know that. We live in, in times that right across the UK, not least in our own province, 
and on the rest of this island are perhaps more challenging than they have been in the past. If you saw the statistics quite recently, and those who have no commitment at all uh, to Jesus Christ, no religion at all of any description, it's amazing to reflect that it's in those areas, uh, North Down and Ards, and in Lisburn and Castle Ray, where Presbyterianism ought to be most strong. If you look at the statistics, you'll find that answering a census form, 300,000 plus people will put down that they are Presbyterians. But only 196 seem to have any commitment at all to Presbyterian churches, our own churches. And even within that context, many just might be nominal members. And our, our role, our goal has to be to move from that to the point where there is commitment which is total and absolute, focusing on the future. I was struck by a quotation from the Belfast Telegraph a couple of weeks back. It came from one of our more recently retired ministers, actually in Enniskillen, and he said this, and I'm quoting, Christians are now so out of step with prevailing values in Western culture that criticism, and I might add opposition, goes with the territory. If Jesus was crucified, his followers can expect to be criticized. We need to face that challenge. Our whole church, our whole Presbyterian church needs to face that challenge. All those who commit their lives to, to, to Jesus as Lord need to face that challenge. But we're not alarmed by that. God is sovereign. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Past, present, and future. Last Sunday, as you know, was Pentecost Sunday. That time when especially we remember the outpouring of God's Holy Spirit. Third person of the Trinity on his church. This verse that we, we read earlier. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. In a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit, and you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now, every one of us will pay lip service, at least, to this verse. But we can miss the reality of it. When is the last time? It's, a, it, it's a, not a question I'm expecting to put your hand up to, obviously. A rhetorical question. When is the last time you were deeply conscious of the guiding and leading and empowering and inspiring of God's Holy Spirit in your own life? It's a personal question. I know that. Nobody can answer it for you or for me except ourselves alone. When was the last time you were actually conscious of that? The prompting and the leading to go here, go there, speak to this person, to that person. Someone in need, we don't know whether they're in need, but just to follow the promptings of God's Spirit. When's the last time we actually did that? You or me? It's a message for all of us, isn't it? If we don't have that inspiration, if we don't have that touch of God's spirit, if we're not familiar with it or aware of it, or somehow we shut him out, then we're trying to do God's work in our own strength with deep sincerity. Sometimes even maybe, as I said before, trying to tell God how it ought to be done. But without the power promised by Jesus, we can do nothing of lasting value. None of us. That's why it's important. That's why we pause in the present to reflect on these things so that we focus on the future in terms of our witness as Christians. Man-made programs will come and they'll go, but it's what we do in our fellowships, in the love, in the truth that mirrors God's truth, in the care for a sinful and fallen world, recognizing our own many failings. That's what sits at the heart of our life and work as a people, isn't it? It's then we are effective as witnesses in our own Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, the own place where God has set us, wherever it might be, whether it's in Glenwary or whether it's in Valley Home where we presently worship or in those congregations where I, I was in after leaving Glenwary, in all of those places. This is what it's all about, isn't it? God is sovereign and he has set us in our own Jerusalems and Judea and Samaria to be his witnesses. What else would it be about? If it's not about that, that's our high calling as Christian believers. I coined the phrase myself one time, and I've used it in one or two contexts. There are no cringing Christians cowering in a corner. We are not fearful. There are no cringing Christians cowering in a corner. 
Now, that doesn't mean to say we're all going to be standing on a platform to proclaim God's word. Some are gifted that way, but not everyone. Not everyone. I know some in Glenwary are gifted that way. Some are gifted in a one-to-one -one situation, and not everyone is gifted in that way. I remember one of our ministers, greatly used, a friend of mine, the Reverend Hard Lewis. So if you're older, you'll remember him, sadly taken from us far too young. And he was a tremendous pulpit speaker from a platform, from a pulpit. And I remember him being honest one time and saying, on a one-to-one -one situation, he acknowledged that he was not good. Everybody has their own gifts, their own talents, God-given, Spirit-given. Have we ever thought about our own gift, our own talent in Christ, Spirit-given, according to the promise of the Savior? See, we're all different. We're different in personalities. But we are all called to be his witnesses in one way or in another. Think of Romans chapter 10 and verse 13 to 15. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? Here surely is the mission of the church, our whole church. And dare I say it as one coming in from the outside, here is the mission of Glenwary Church. Here is our calling. Here is our mission. In this we find the motivation from the past. In this we pause as we reflect on it in the present. And in this we find the vision for the future. For where there is no vision, then the people perish. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Our Father God, we give you thanks that you have called us. Before we were ever aware of our need of you, your Holy Spirit quickened our own spirits and made us aware of that need. And we give you thanks for the love that you show to us. We give you thanks for the death of your Son on Calvary's cross, dying for our salvation. And we ask that we might know the high, high calling with which you have called us, that it might touch us even as we gather here this morning, that we might go forward again refreshed and renewed, reinvigorated in our lives of committed service, whether it's in our speaking from a platform or a one-to-one -one situation or even in our lives of prayer. In all these things, our Father God, we are dependent on you and we give to you the glory and the praise. And as we come before you now, we bring all these things before you. In Jesus' precious name, amen. I chose this last hymn deliberately, and, and could I say a word of thanks to Evelyn and uh, to Martin, for Martin helped me put all this together in the sense that I sent him down emails and that, and he, he, he did the magic bit, uh, and, and for our hymns this morning with Evelyn and so on uh, with us. Uh, I chose this one deliberately simply because of the context of the service in which we are worshiping here today. Lord, for the years your love has kept and guided, urged and inspired us, cheered us on our way sought us and saved us, pardoned and provided. Lord of the years, we bring our thanks today. <laughs>
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, the communion and fellowship of his Holy Spirit, rest and abide with each one of us, now and evermore. Amen.